Uh, our next panel uh, will deal with the tension uh, between uh, urban uh, and uh, uh, the, the local, uh, um, so to say, the rural, uh, and uh, finding a new view on uh, our issue. Uh, and uh, this goes together that we are not only cities but there are still also rural areas uh, and uh, what does that mean again uh, in terms of uh, cultural policy. Uh, we again found a number uh, of uh, interesting uh, speakers uh, will go uh, in the same way uh, than uh, in the first round there will be short uh, presentations of 10-15 uh, minutes and then hopefully uh, again uh, a lively uh, debate. Uh, we'll start with uh, uh, Patrick. Uh, no, I have to add, and this is a pity, uh, don't believe uh, that rural areas are just in Germany. Uh, <laughs> I do say so uh, because uh, there are three colleagues uh, uh, coming uh, from Germany talking about these uh, issues, but they promised to go beyond the borders uh, and also find uh, relationships hopefully uh, together also with you. Uh, our colleague from Austria, uh, Peter Oswald, can't be with us, uh, he is ill. I will tell a few words on what is his work uh, about, but now we'll start with uh, Patrick uh, uh, Föhl, uh, who uh, uh, is mainly... Uh, you start, yes. uh, so you see, Sorry. this is quite independent, <laughs> is this enough? <laughs> uh, Dorit Götzki, uh, she comes from the University of uh, Hildesheim, uh, uh, is uh, working uh, there, uh, and as far as I have learned, uh, has done a lot of, uh, re uh, of uh, research uh, in the regional uh, context and maybe one of the best uh, uh, people uh, to talk about the particularities and in our uh, discussion that we had uh, preparing this uh, conference she also uh, talked about that about very fundamental issues uh, not just about the differences between uh, cities and rural areas but also uh, on definition question of culture, what we are talking uh, about when we are talking about uh, cultural policies in rural areas. areas. But the floor is Thank you very much. Yeah, we are coming to the periphery, and it means when I talk about periphery, rural regions. Um, uh, and uh, my input is so-called on the relationship between amateur culture, art and cultural policy. Mm. My engagement with the subject of amateur culture results primarily um, from my research work on the subject on cultural policy in rural areas. Um, for that reason, I would first like to say something about rural areas and cultural policy. Um, how are rural, how are our rural areas doing? The good news. Rural areas are in fashion. At least if you look at the advertising and or the magazine market. Um, the great in interest in Rusty City is therefore primarily a lifestyle trend, um, which may have influence on the way we eat or dress or what kind of furniture we put in our houses but um, it has nothing to do with the actual development of rural areas. Uh, the countryside currently offers a prote projection surface for the journeys of the modern society, which, however, have little to do with the past or the present of uh, rural regions, at least in Germany. Maybe uh, it is different in other countries. Because the story of the rural areas is above all a story of declining significance. Mm. 
In cultural policy, the rural area plays mainly a role as a problem area uh, in connection with the demographic change we are suffered by uh, in Germany. Rural areas are predominantly seen as loss maker. The special structural and social features of the rural area are not, however, particularly addressed by cultural policy. Mm. But what now distinguishes uh, the culture in rural areas? An essential feature of cultural in the rural, rural areas is that cultural work is organized by here primarily on a civil society basis. And that there are many offers uh, in amateur culture rather than in professional cultural facilities. Um, but in what way cultural policy acts with that fact? First, um, we have all we have often the situation uh, when you talk to people who are in charge for cultural policy uh, that they feel uh, they are the opinion or have the opinion um, that uh, man had, you have to fund um, real art for the poor people in the countryside because they, are, they have no real art. Second, the funding of culture is often designed in such a way as to fund the most innovative or artistically value valuable projects. This stands in contrast to the fact that many civil society actors in the area of amateur culture, but also in the field of community arts, in rural areas often lack the money for their normal work. Um, and the third feature of cultural policy in rural areas is that rural communities can hardly fulfill their cultural policy responsibilities because they, there is no professional staff in the, um, for culture in the local administrations. Maybe Patrick uh, in, can say something about the project he made. I think that was a problem too, that there are no people who are really in charge in rural areas for questions of culture and cultural policy. Um, I have now used the term amateur culture several times. Um, maybe I should explain what I mean with amateur culture. Um, Amateur culture is a culture that is embedded in the life world of people. It is characterized by the fact that it's an everyday part of people's life and it's located in the geographic and social yeah, proximity of people, uh, like the family, the circle of friends, or the neighborhood. Um, I mean with, uh, or when I talk about amateur culture, I talk about choirs, drama groups, traditional costumes, association, folk dancing groups, and things like that. Um, amateur culture makes the active cultural or artistic involvement of people not only possible, uh, but absolutely necessary. Um, but what about the political recognition of this area in Germany? Um, before I want to show you or I want to talk about the recognition uh, in that field, I want to show you a little spot.
Ladies and gentlemen, why am I showing you a spot from the campaign of... Oh, that's not what I did. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, why am I showing you a spot from the campaign of the German Football, German Football Association, which was shown regularly during the World Cup last year? Because this campaign impressed me. I was impressed at the degree of empathy uh, with which amateur football is portrayed here. I was impressed by the great recognition shown towards amateur sports by an association which is responsible for the professionals and the amateurs. Compared with amateur sport, I would say that the recognition of amateur culture is quite low in Germany. In particular, the recognition by official cultural policy and by the professionals of the art world. Official lip services is paid to be the fantastic things that people are doing on a voluntary base, uh, but none of that, of course, needs to be taken seriously um, as culture or at, uh, at least at art. Indeed, the professional art world often responds fairly disrespectfully uh, to amateur culture. I would like to illustrate this using an example from my own professional practice. Every three years, there's an event in the district of Hildesheim under the heading of Day of the Open Studio. A very simple and successful concept. One weekend in summer, visual artists are all over the region open their studios to the public. People travel around through the region and visit the artists. The artists decide themselves how they want to fill their role as host. Some simply open their studios and show their work. Others create a festival atmosphere. What is particularly important to me about this example in terms of amateur culture? I have organized this event twice, and the biggest problem in the organization each time was the question, who is allowed to take part? In principle, anyone could apply who believed he had a studio that he can open. That led to the situation there are a lot of people applied who con confidently described themselves as hobby artists and who had learned a lot of the skills at evening classes. We had truly difficult discussions in the organization team every time um, as to how many of these lay persons uh, could participate. The professional artists always had a great fear of, uh, fear of being thrown into the same pot as the amateurs. It was feared that the image of the event would suffer if not all the participants had a certain artistic level. I and some of my colleagues argued, on the other hand, that this event is not an art exhibition, but a cultural event in which we wanted to show the cultural diversity of the region. And this also includes art by lay persons. For many professional arts, it was a reason not to take part in the event. Overall, there was a ratio of two-thirds professional artists to one-third hobby artists. What effect did this colorful mix of participations have on the event? Even the visitors uh, were in fact more diverse then I know this from other art events. Mm. I cannot prove it scientifically, but my observation was that the participations of the amateurs also brought a lot of friends and family members of these hobby artists through the studios. And my impression was that, that, that many of them, they're not the typical visitor you would see at exhibitions of contemporary art. They belonged rather to the so-called new target groups we are so desperately trying to attract to cultural facilities. 
I was interested, it was interesting to see that these people visit not only their hobby artist friends, but also the real artists. Because the barrier to the engagement with art was no longer as high as it usually is. It were an event where people's own friends and family were taking part as artists and they could uh, visit all the uh, participants at home. That means that the mixture of professional artists and hobby artists attract an audience that was much more diverse than we usually find this at cultural events. So what did I learn from this experience and from my scientific engagement with the art industry? The professionals have very little appreciation for the artistic activities of lay persons. This is mainly to the fact that quality is a disease cri sorry a disease cri criterion and Quality for arts, or the question, what is quality in arts, is the most important question. But the paradox is, quality in contemporary arts was abolished um, several years ago, because you can't, quality, um, that's not a criterion that you can, that's measurable objectively. We no longer identify quality in visual arts with technical skill. This is a difference to music uh, or sports. In sport, the professionals do not have to worry that their better quality of performance will go unnoticed because it is usually easily measurable in times, distance or goals. In my view, and this is my presumption here, the lack of recognition for amateur culture can only be explained as a form of insecurity. Uh, an insecurity on the part of the professionals about the relevance and the quality of their own artistic activity. Because the quality, quality particularly of visual arts, does not necessarily speak for itself. And it must first be generated in a complex procedure, mainly by attribution and delineation. Um, I'm nearly at the end, have you more? <laughs> um, so I think um, we have to talk about um, amateur culture in a different way when we talk about art in context of cultural policy. There are not the same standards, but why do I think that amateur culture is important? Um, it is important for rural regions because um, it's, a basic, it's basic um, in lots of villages for a social community. And we need this social community for having a kind of public space or public sphere to um, yeah, to have a relation between the members of a community. That's what uh, amateur culture is for. It's not for art, it's for community, for social. It has a social function. And that's why I think it's so important for cultural policy to cope with this field. But we have to cope in another way. Last words, um, overall we must resist the temptation to make more about amateur culture than it is. This also means that not necessarily everything has to be kept alive, that's a big topic in Germany. Um, if a man's choir with a 120 year old tradition can no longer find new singers, then this tradition simply ends and maybe um, something or something uh, else will develop. Um, I'm aware that I have, a pre I have presented this subject from a very German view. Uh, for this reason, I'm very interesting, uh, interested to find out whether amateur culture is a topic in other countries as well. Thank you for your attention.
and be sure that will be a reaction uh, to your presentation. Uh, you addressed a number of uh, uh, different uh, topics, uh, but uh, for me the main thing might be which kind of culture, which kind of art for citizens uh, in cities uh, and are there others uh, uh, in rural uh, areas. But we'll find uh, more about that. I would now like to introduce uh, to you uh, no, I don't think because we do not have to write that. I <laughs> um, uh, would like to introduce to, to, to you uh, Patrick uh, Föhl, uh, who also comes from Germany, from uh, Berlin, uh, and uh, uh, very experienced in cultural management and cultural policy uh, issues, um, running an own uh, network in this uh, respect, but also being uh, involved in a number of planning uh, processes, uh, planning cultural policies, concepts um, for uh, regions and he's also uh, involved in a number of networks, for example, Fachverband für Kultur uh, Management, but maybe we get from your side uh, some uh, results on the planning uh, strategies, please. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yes, I will. Um, since uh, Doreen, um, Doreen um, gave you some basic, let's say, general input on cultural policy in rural areas, I decided to give you a little insight into one of um, uh, our actual projects. And uh, Mark Komotani and Doreen Gerski, they also participated in this project. Um, it's, um, as you can see, I will talk about cultural development planning project in Thuringia. And um, Thuringia is right in the middle of Germany and is very characteristic for German cultural infrastructure because there we have a lot of cultural classical heritage like big theaters, a lot of museums, but also a lot of rural areas. And um, just imagine in Germany about, it depends on the statistics, over 50% uh, of the population is living in rural areas. So this is a very important topic which has not been on the agenda of cultural policy for a long time in Germany. But now it's getting back on the agenda and the project in Thuringia was really interesting because um, as you know Thuringia there is Weimar, Erfurt and a lot of another, some other bigger cities and they get most of the cultural funding. And then the state of Thuringia said now we want to give you uh, the rural areas the possibility to plan the future cultural development. And what they did is they um, raise the question um, what kind of pairs uh, want to apply for this cultural development planning process. That means they, um, they uh, made an outline and um, all the counties and cities in, in uh, Thuringia could apply and the concept, basic concept was that um, always two partners have to apply. So not only one count, county, um, uh, always two cities or two counties and there were two winners the county of Kyffhauser Kreis and the uh, county of Nordhausen in the north of Thuringia. And this is a really interesting pair because um, the Kyffhauser County is a very rural area and uh, the county of Nordhausen as well, but Nordhausen has a big theater with over 350 employees. So even if you talk, if you talk about rural areas in Germany, we still have these huge big cultural infrastructures right in the middle of the rural uh, areas. So this is a really important aspect when we talk about rural areas, but um, there are also a lot of aspects I will uh, come uh, to later on, which are quite similar, for example, like in the United States or in Egypt. So there are some similarities, I would say, all over the planet when we talk about rural areas and uh, lay uh, cultural uh, activities, for example. And the other county was in the south of Thuringia, uh, the county of Hildburghausen and Sonneberg. Some people know Sonneberg because they have the biggest museum for toys because they have a long tradition of toy making in the uh, south of Thuringia. And uh, the south is very different because they're connected to Bavaria. So they have a Franconian um, background. They're not really Thuringians, they're Franconia, even if they are in Thuringia. So that was the, the, the two uh, counties. And I will now um, talk a, about, a little bit about what we did. Um, I call this the carpet of opportunities. So our goal was our... Um, let's say, um, approach was to find out how can these two regions develop an up-to-date cultural policy approach for the next 
10 to 15 years. And that means, uh, first of all, how can it transform the cultural institutions? Because one thing is, was very clear, and everybody said it, we have to transform the institutions. So that, that, does, that, that, that means it's not about closing them, it's about transforming them, because if we, if we close something, there will, there will be no cultural infrastructure there anymore. But it was very clear that, for example, in Nordhausen, we don't need a classical theater in this structure anymore. We need a cultural house, which has a core of theater playing, but maybe is also interconnecting or in helping, for example, associations and lay uh, people. Uh, so that was our biggest goal was uh, the to answer the question of transformation. So what we did is a lot of workshops, you know, all these kind of things we can do in planning, uh, a lot of talking, uh, workshopping, analyzing, and um, a lot of public, um, you know, summits. And uh, so we did, that, that was really one of the biggest cultural planning projects in Germany within the last years. So we did a lot of activity, a lot of talking, exchanging, and analyzing, and at the end, um, we, uh, I would say, we, we, have, we, we really came up with some transforming, um, actions. I will come to this in a minute, but first of all, I will give you a little impression about the regions. Um, just some pictures. This is the theater in Nordhausen. So this is something you maybe not expect in a rural area, but it is in uh, Nordhausen, and Nordhausen has, is the biggest city in north of Thuringia and has 40,000 inhabitants. But the big theater, they also have a big uh, public transportation system, so what we have a lot of times is we have small cities with the infrastructure of big cities. So there was, this is a really difficult question because then the question is how can we transform this because the population in these cities is still very rural. That means also a lot of association, a lot of lay, lay uh, activities, but also having these big, big um, cultural infrastructures. That means that even if you're in the rural areas, we have a cultural policy which is normally orientated on city cultural policy and not a specific rural cultural policy. So that was really interesting. Uh, same thing as a lot of museums, only speaking about the two counties in the south of Thuringia, there we have 60 museums. Big ones, smaller ones, but seven museums which are funded by the public authorities. So um, also here, big infrastructure, but, and then now it gets different, but what is the real asset of rural areas? It's the nature, especially in Thuringia, very beautiful nature, so this is something which is quite different to the cities. So this is something they have to, can offer. And uh, this is, was one of the tasks to bring nature and culture together. For example, when we talk about cultural tourism. And then there was another very interesting thing. Since Thuringia is uh, facing a big demographic change, a lot of spaces are empty. Castles are empty. The stores are empty. So what we can see is that more and more, for example, people, young people who went away from the region because they studied somewhere else or worked somewhere else, they're now coming back in their, uh, you know, where they originated, and now they're coming back with interesting art projects. So this is uh, one picture from a very small town in Thuringia, and um, there are three people who are making public theater plays, who make uh, cinema uh, things, and all kinds of stuff, and it really works because they are they're having a very open and participatory approach. Um, so we, one of the tasks was from our side to say, we have to make them visible, because we, we, I mean, you know maybe the concept of local heroes, you know, key persons, or, or key persons um, new associations, which are uh, making interesting uh, projects. And uh, so one of our jobs was to make them participate in the, in the cultural planning process and make them visible for the politicians. Because a lot of times they are there, but nobody really knows about them except their specific scenes. And the next step was to bring them together, for example, with the classical infrastructure. So they can participate from each other, just to give you some examples. So this is how it looks like in, in this region. And um, because I only have 10 minutes, uh, I try to, to sum it up a little bit. And uh, first, in the, the first slide, uh, I want to outline, let's say, cultural policy questions uh, which we have in the cities, but also in the rural areas. So in uh, Thuringia, we also talked about inward orientation, outward orientation. That means, just to make it very simple, inward orientation is mostly connected to cultural education. So how can we foster cultural development for our citizens? improve cultural education in schools, in, uh, in all kinds of other uh, institutions. And then the other question was, how can we foster cultural development to the outside? And mostly cultural tourism stands for that. 
that means when you uh, just keep the pictures in mind, how can we combine the beautiful nature with the cultural infrastructure and how can we develop an interesting narrative about our region? So people come there and uh, visit um, the county or the region. That means, uh, but this is the same questions we have in the cities. How can we foster an inward development by culture and how can we present ourselves to the outside? So this is very similar. It's the same question about institutional funding and project funding. What is uh, a good mixture, the good combination? It's the same question like in the cities. And it's the same about collaboration and competition and also about preservation and renewing. So how can we preserve cultural heritage, but also how can we have more modern approaches? Because the Rand said it already, over 90% of the cultural funding normally is going into the high class cultural institutions, also in the rural areas. That means there's only a very small amount for project funding. So uh, we had the same question there. How can we maybe rearrange this percentage? Or how can we make uh, the cultural infrastructure, the high cultural infrastructure, more open to collaboration, for example, for local heroes, for associations? And now I'm coming to the other aspect. What was very special in the rural areas is really finding the right mix mixture between public offerings and fostering voluntary work, lay cultural approaches. First of all, how can we combine it as the RAN presented it? Because there is a very strong, uh, um, I would say, segmentation until now. So how can we have more combination? And how, for example, how to convince a director of a theater to work with um, volunteer associations, for example. So how can we bring them together? And also, how can we change culture, cultural policy in rural areas so they focus more also on this aspect? Because especially in regions where we have a big demographic change, that means people are going away, you have more and more old people. And uh, for example, I'm working in Brandenburg right now, a lot of unemployed people, you need a specific form of culture and that cannot be high culture to foster certain community developments. So this is something we have really, uh, to keep in mind. And then very other important aspect was the mixture between centrality and decentrality. That means having steady offerings of culture and then the question how can you bring this from in the rural areas because even in rural areas you have centers and normally in the centers you have all the cultural infrastructure but when people are not mobile anymore like young people or old people you have to find ways to make uh, culture more accessible to them so you need mobile uh, things or even through the internet for example so there was one of the biggest questions in uh, in this in this area and surely uh, just give you another example one very important topic and this is something which is very very big discussed in the United States is the topic of equity. That means going way beyond the topic of audience development, audience building, and raising the question of equity. What does it really mean? For example, in Thuringia, now we have a big discussion about refugees. That means uh, what, does it, what does it really mean for the cultural sector in Thuringia? Because they have no, no experience working with refugees. But now, even in Thuringia, which used to be in the GDR, so there's barely an experience with, with people from foreign countries. Now it's the question, how can we uh, foster these developments? How can we integrate people who are coming from Syria or from North Africa, for example? So that was one of, one of the biggest questions, and equity means really to integrate uh, this aspect. That means, for example, even employing somebody or integrating somebody into a classical cultural institution. So that was one of the biggest topics, and uh, there was one really interesting uh, picture from the Ministry of Culture. He said that now in the churches in Thuringia, which are almost empty because people are not very religious in Thuringia, now we have uh, peop uh, families from, from Eritrea which are sitting in the first row of the benches and, and uh, Christian families from Eritrea. So that means what what, is that, what does it mean for culture? So this is one of the biggest topics as well. I mean, it's the same in the cities, but it's really sp specific in the rural areas. So to sum it up, um, as Doreen said, one of the most important things is that we have to fill in missing links and gaps because uh, we barely have people who are coordinating uh, or collaborating or you can talk to in these areas because they broke away uh, in the cultural administration, for example. So we need new people who are fostering these developments, communication, for example. But it doesn't mean that we have to have no new employees in cultural administration. We can also use other formats. 
uh, in the tourist sector, for example, or the educational sector. So this is one thing. And then uh, to come to the end, I would go here. Um, we need another approach in cultural policy for peripheral regions. That means we cannot transform just our experiences and concept for city cultural policy to the rural areas. We really need a different aspect, another concept, which is really taking this into consideration I just said. So this is really important from my point of view. Uh, but we shouldn't play them off. So from my point of view, it's not rural versus urban cultural policy. It's really how can we bring them together? Because that's, for me, very important. Even, I'm, you said I'm coming from Berlin, a lot of times in these days I can experience that the most interesting artistic approaches are coming from the rural areas. And then they're coming back to the city. So you can now see a lot of people going from Berlin, for example, into the rural areas of Brandenburg. And look what are they doing there, and then they bring it back to the city. So there are a lot of connections. So um, on one side, we need a specific cultural policy for rural areas. But on the other side, we really have to uh, think more about how we can we bring experience together, because they can be really fruitful for each other. So this is a little input. Thank you very much. Just after receiving the um, just after receiving the invitation to this conference, I received another invitation, this time from Hanover, the capital of a northern German state and one of the country's 15 largest cities. The subject: What should culture look like in Hanover from the point of view of cultural producers and the urban community in 2030? Those invited to speak included the chairman of the board of directors at a large bank, the business manager of the Kulturpolitische Gesellschaft, um, the Society for Cultural Politics in Germany, I hope that's right because there's someone there sitting there, from the, the cultural officer of the Deutsche Städtetag, an association of German cities, and myself, representing the Ruhr Triennale program series, No Education. I had no money to present, no serious influence in the large world of German culture, just the idea of a three-year program series at a festival that plays out in the Ruhr area. My decision to accept the invitation to today's conference has a great deal to do with that second invitation. 
for it seems that no education has had a cultural political impact that, for example, convinced Hanover's cultural policymakers that the idea could provide inspiration for the development of cultural practice and cultural policies in their city. The festival Ruhr Triennale let's see, <laughs> takes place in the Ruhr region, the most populous region in all of Germany. 4.1 million residents live here across 4.5 thousand square kilometers in 53 cities and four municipalities, making it the third largest metropolitan area in all of Europe. In a sense, the urban space of Germany with all the social realities that entails. One quarter of the residents, or 37% of the children in the Ruhr region have an immigrant background. The average unemployment rate is 11.1%. After Berlin, the Ruhr region um, has the highest poverty rate in all of Germany. In the structurally weak large cities, twice as many young people are recipients of state support than the average for the state as a whole. The Ruhr Triennale is an international arts festival. In former factories, like this one in Dienstlagen, mine heaps and the ruins of mining and the steel industry, each summer the festival presents opera, theater, dance, art and music. The change of cultural director every three years ensures that the festival constantly receives new artistic impulses. The annual costs are 14.5 million euros, 80% of which is financed by tax money and the EU funds. A marketing survey, the festival has recently distilled, um, survey of the festival has recently distilled the identity of an average Ruhr Triennale attendee, a woman in her late 40s, a college graduate with a mid to high income. The people who attend the festival are those with money and education whose self-understanding includes attending high culture events regularly or at least on occasion. No education was a series held by Rotary Annales Education and Outreach Department from 2012 to 2014. No education is based on the unrelenting faith that anyone regardless of their background or their education, can develop a direct, unprejudiced relationship to art. No intermediaries, no mediation is required. A festival jury was founded to prove this. Over the past three years, almost 300 children and young people have seen all the events at the Ruhr Triennale, and I truly mean each and every one. They were picked up in, lim they were picked up in limousines, entered the venues on the red carpet, always set in the first row, and spoke with the artists after the event. At the end of the festival, the jury awarded each event a prize in a category of their own definition. The Children's Choice Awards was a project of the Canadian performance group Mammalian Diving Reflex. These children, aged 11, aged 11 to 14, represent the social periphery in two ways. On the one hand, as being children, quote, International political economist Alison Watson argues that childhood is not a phase through which all adults pass, but a permanent social category, a class. As a class, children remain the last minority we are legally entitled to discriminate against, according to Darren O'Donnell, artistic director of Mammalian Diving Reflex. On the other hand, they are representatives of the social periphery of the European urban space. The participants all come from schools in so-called problem areas. At comprehensive school Gelsenkirchen-Ückendorf, for example, the percentage of pupils with an immigrant background is 95%. Without the festival jury, hardly any of these children would have attended the Ruhr Triennale or indeed the theater at all. With the Children's Choice Awards, the Ruhr Triennale and No Education made the social periphery visible to the artists the audience and the festival team. This making visible is key to the project's success. In this way, social reality breaks into the festival. It not, could not be overlooked or ignored. This project was perceived and discussed. It polarized and was a cause for excitement. The claim that these children could encounter art just like a culturally versed adult is a challenge. In the words of Carmen Mersch to, quote, 
unlearned privileges and to go beyond what we think we already know. Directly engaging with the participants to develop projects of cultural education in a way that leads away from the reproduction of existing relations to actual change. Everyone who encountered these children had to decide whether they are ready to engage with this joint change. Which ultimately meant nothing less than the integration of the social periphery, at least over the short term. One choreographer wanted to cancel her performance if the children sat in the first row, or even if the red carpet were laid out for them. One opera singer refused to perform, the premiere could not begin until the children were replaced in a rather difficult reseating operation with other spectators in the first row. For the children, that was the highlight of the evening. One teacher, whose class was part of the program, cancelled her participation because she thought the performances are not suitable for the children. The school children themselves had a different opinion and concluded the project without support from their school. The spectators also had to come to terms with the bored or hyperactive children clapping at all the wrong times. Everyone had to decide how to behave, by negotiating or commanding, insisting on privilege or surrendering just a bit of the hegemonic power held to be so secure. In his book, Social Acupuncture, the head of mammalian diving reflex points out, we must be careful not to simply create projects that glorify the sweet, whimsical and easy, projects that reinforce enclaves of race, culture, art and gender. We need to start engaging with unease and discomfort. No education brought movement into the standard relationships between children, art and education. Many of the typical barriers fell between the generations, between languages and culture, but also between professionals and amateurs, between knowledge and non-knowledge, between center and periphery. This movement in turn came from a marginal position. The change in artistic director every three years, who even chooses the name of the festival, allows for great liberties in terms of cultural policy. The term cannot be extended no matter what. This fact, coupled with a respectable budget, leads to an unbelievable artistic freedom. No education was a true challenge. In the first year, no foundation was willing to support the project. Norbert Lammert, the president of the German Bundestag and a great friend of the Ruhr Triennale, a patron for many years, was not prepared to support a project that is directed expressly against education. It was only in 2013, after the courage and the financial risk of the first year, that no education was able to gain a partner, the Mercator Foundation. And happily from the very first year, the founding cultural director of Ruhr Triennale and free thinker Gérard Mortier served as a more than fitting patron. In 2011, no education was developed for the Ruhr Triennale by head dramaturge Marietta Pickenbrock. In 2013, the Rat für kulturelle Bildung, uh, it's a council for cultural education, published, published Alles immer gut in which projects of cultural education were freed of all duties to accomplish social tasks. Quote, empirically speaking, such claims stand on shaky ground. In part, they are simply false. That same year, Ruben Gatztambide Fernandez published the essay, Why Arts Don't Do Anything, in Harvard Educational Review, in which he argued similarly, showing how differently the term arts is mobilized depending on place and use. Naturally, no education was not solely responsible for these developments. This paradigm shift was already in the air and could be felt in many places. In her essay on, on no education, permanently temporary, Marietta Pickenbrock wrote, perhaps festivals are the right tools to widen this perspective. They have the luxury that they can do both, generate good ideas and realize them in the actual world. The official invitation of the city of Hanover to the event I mentioned at the outset claims that, quote, without art and culture, cities lack urbanity. On the one hand, I agree entirely, and yet cultural projects and projects of cultural education often remain without a palpable influence on the development of, or the future of a city or a region. They take place alongside politics, alongside the institutions that have a visible and effective hold on the life of a city. They take place in the periphery. Darren O'Donnell would respond to the conference organizers in Hanover in the following words, to once again quote from his book, Social Acupuncture. Okay, so you want in, uh, so you want to make culture and creativity a central part of civic life? Fine, then I want in on the institutions that form at ground level the fabric of the city. I want to use these as material in my art practice. 
Thank you. I had enjoyed uh, when uh, Peter Oswald had been also uh, with us. Uh, Peter Oswald uh, was the director uh, of a festival uh, called Steirischer Herbst, uh, uh, which is a region uh, in the south, uh, in the east-south uh, of Austria. Uh, and uh, by that, uh, uh, he provided a number of um, fascinating activities, not just in Graz, but also uh, in the uh, rural areas. Uh, and I was particularly fascinated uh, by another Oh, sorry, by another uh, activity called Akana uh, Festival, uh, which is around Atmont, uh, maybe a similar city like Nordhausen, uh, more Catholic uh, maybe. Uh, but the point was that uh, Mr. Peter Oswald uh, is very much in charge of new music, new classical uh, contemporary uh, music projects. Uh, he runs an own label uh, uh, for uh, CDs, but he brought a number uh, of uh, uh, internationally renowned uh, composers and musicians to this uh, area uh, and started a cooperation with people living uh, there, uh, particularly uh, with an enterprise producing car parts. Uh, and there had been a number of employees who had no idea of uh, new music uh, and they started a common uh, working process uh, for about uh, three weeks. Uh, and then they presented uh, uh, the result in the frame uh, of this Akana uh, festival. Uh, the people there got the first idea what is contemporary music about. So it's not, uh, in a certain way, this kind of contradiction are talking about amateur or is it part then of a sophisticated uh, arts um, project, including severe social conflicts. Uh, I had the chance uh, to look at that when family, not to say broke apart, but at least there had been conflicts uh, uh, when uh, the husband was saying, you shouldn't take part uh, in that. They are just doing crazy uh, things and instead uh, the woman insisted, I want to be part um, of uh, that. She stood that conflict and they were acclaimed uh, in the very very uh, end, uh, but this was not just a peripheral thing for them, this was central um, uh, for, for them to decide being part of the game uh, or uh, not. Uh, he would have talked about uh, that uh, much uh, better than me, but just to bring in this um, uh, example. But starting our common uh, discussion uh, going back to uh, what you, Doreen, were saying. On one hand, rural area is trendy. Uh, you, you said. This is uh, something of increasing importance. Even um, people from the cities go back for relaxing and being close to nature uh, and, uh, uh, and all that. And on the other hand, you say it's a problem. <laughs> uh, it, it's, a, it's a cultural policy problem. It's mainly seen as a, uh, as a problem. Uh, uh, would you agree on that or uh, say a little bit more about that? Yes, so uh, the, the fashion of the rural areas is a lifestyle trend, I said. I think it's nothing to do with the real constitution of, of rural areas. That's the problem, I think. And um, cultural policy always, not only cultural policy, we, we talked about that uh, uh, today further on, um, rural areas in most real rural areas, and I think the rural beat is not a rural area. I'm talking about rural areas. Yeah, um, it's very urban, I think. Um, but I'm coming from Lower Saxonia, and there's uh, very rural regions with lots of tiny little villages, not so many centers, and um, all kind of poli politics, or, um, for all kind of politics, the rural areas are a problem room right now. For uh, cultural, for social, 
politics uh, because of uh, the demographic change. We have lots of old people there. We are not quite sure how to cope with the problems of old people in rural areas. We have uh, problems with the health policy. We have no doctors in rural areas anymore. So every time rural areas are uh, problem rooms, uh, especially in cultural policy as well. Yeah. And now you brought in uh, a quite a provocation as far as I understood when you were said for this problematic people it's mainly about amateur art. Uh, it's mainly about what they already know and what they are tra traditionally uh, involved in and that's why I brought in this example from Akana Festival. Is it able also uh, to confront these people with more advanced uh, versions and uh, I think this goes together with uh, what you were talking about. Young people, they had no experience at all with, in contemporary uh, 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 contemporary uh, art. Nevertheless, you uh, involved them. Uh, you said, yes, you can stand that and this makes sense. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. one. I have no problems with these kind of project, yeah. but that's um, that's not. There are projects for a very short time. That's not uh, the daily business of the people. And I just say the daily cultural business of people is amateur culture. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's necessary to have these form of culture because we can't fund these kind of projects all over the rural areas. That's not, I think that's not the way cultural policy uh, should go. It should accept what is located in the rural areas. But would you say there is a principal difference between uh, city and rural when I would say amateur art is also something uh, what is for people uh, in, in cities? Uh, and I think this was your argument, uh, Patrick. Maybe we are talking about uh, alongside the wrong uh, confrontation. It's not about uh, rural uh, and uh, uh, city. It's maybe about education, social background, uh, whatsoever. May I bring you in? I mean, it's, it's much more complex than we're just trying to yeah. shape in it, but um, I think surely um, I would agree that, that um, for example, I grew up in Kreuzberg and we had barely any contact to uh, contemporary art <laughs> back then. So it's, it's also a question of, of, of city life and people in the city. So it's, all, it's about the milieu you're coming from, I would say. And it depends on the district and city sometimes. So um, you can have similar experiences, but I, th I would agree with uh, Doreen. Uh, but because um, I think that um, the, the one problem is really is, is, is the mobility. And uh, in, in Berlin, if you really want to experience something, you can experience it. And if in, in the rural areas, you really have to go, you really have to want it at some point, or the, the parents have to want it. The school system cannot really take care of it because it's not so accessible like in the cities. So um, this is one of the big differences. Therefore, I said one of the big differences between city and rural areas is the is, uh, central and decentral. Uh, structures and I think it's more a lot of times it's more like a structure it's more a structural problem at, at some point than um, the problem or let's say that and, and then we have the demographic change uh, the problem is also who stays in the rural areas I mean the young people I mean normally uh, if they want to accomplish something they go away when they turn 18 uh, and then they're not there anymore so that's 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 a big problem so who stays behind normally young men Without education, all the women go away, and then you have all people. And then, yeah, then you have to really have a, then it's a big challenge to make a good cultural policy because, because then normally they, tr they, because they have to make numbers, the theaters, they will focus on the old people because they have time and in these days at least money. It will be different in 20 years, but right now the old people is a very interesting target group because they have money and time. And they normally, uh, if you have the right connection, they're also interested in culture a lot of times, or you can re-interest re them in culture. So this is, so there are the big differences from my point of view when we talk about cultural policy in rural areas. Um, Catherine, uh, as far as I saw, uh, the youngsters uh, taking part uh, in your education had no problem with uh, transportation. They were brought by Cadillac and other uh, vehicles. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, is it exemplary? Yeah, but it's, I, I just wanted to say something um, 
to um, the mobility. We didn't do that. Um, of course, we, we also did it because it's chic and we wanted to make them visible, but those um, mobility in a metropolitan area can be a big problem. Those young people, they never leave their cities. They, they can't, they, don't, they, they have never been to another city, maybe if they live really close by. And for once, it's really expensive. And um, if they don't get a ticket from their city, and a lot of them didn't have a ticket, they, they wouldn't be able to pay the, um, for the bus and the uh, transportation. Um, so we had to get them and bring them back home, otherwise they couldn't have participated. So, of course, you know, it, it sounds so fancy, but it was very important. When you talked about uh, the uneducated boys and the elderly uh, people, uh, is there a particular role of cultural policy? Can cultural policy do anything uh, about these circumstances? Well, I think, um, I think um, the problem is right now cultural policy has to heal the world, maybe, at uh, some point. So a lot of times uh, everybody is focusing right now on cultural development, cultural policy, because everybody think, thinks that uh, culture can really foster something different. Uh, I think um, culture can have a big impact. Um, but only if, when we think it together with educational sector um, and then, um, for example, with companies. So what we do, for example, when we make cultural planning, we always try to integrate all relevant actors also from other fields because only together we can have an impact from my point of view and then culture can have a big impact for example um, when we talk about real areas as you said and you all as well it's a lot of time it's a bad picture so uh, the problem is um, when I'm from a rural area um, in East Germany most of the times people will say oh I feel sorry for you because this is a you know a region which is dying out. So the problem is there are dominating negative pictures about change in rural areas, and that's the biggest problem from my point of view. So culture can really work and help on finding new pictures and new narratives about change. Mm -hmm. So in Thuringia, a lot of times we, we discussed what kind of pictures can we draw through culture, which are positive and different from the pictures people have in mind when they think about the region. Right now, so this is one thing where, where I see culture as a really, really important thing. And the, the other questions, I think it's, it's about the combination and bringing the right people together. For example, companies. We have companies also in rural areas, so we have to integrate them. Because most of the times we have international people, even in the rural areas, which are working in these companies. So if we integrate them into cultural development processes, we have much more power than only looking on arts and culture as a you know, segment and pillar. I was mentioning in the morning, I think uh, you came a little bit later, the results of last uh, year uh, when there was the idea bringing in cultural policy in a value chain together uh, with other uh, policy fields. And obviously this might be also true uh, in, in terms of rural uh, aspects and uh, uh, rural uh, planning. Markus Davy wants to come in uh, and also uh, Professor. Thank you very much for your presentations. Fascinating. Uh, I am um, no expert on German cultural policy making, but I wondered who makes German cultural policy and do you include those uneducated young men and those older people in the cultural policy making? Um, I know many countries have pretty much didactic or directed down policy making. Um, something we've been trying to do in Britain is completely change that. Um, but I'm going to talk a bit about that later. It's just interesting to know how cultural policy making is made. Uh, yes, since we are a feroistic country, um, it's, on, it's made on different levels, but primarily it's made on the community level because that's the closest you can get to the people. But, but uh, when we talk about rural areas, it's a big problem because we don't have classical cultural politicians anymore because most of the times you have somebody in the political field which is responsible for social development, for women, sports, culture and something else. So there is no um, real type anymore of cultural politicians in rural areas, but it's still made, and when we, when we look on, on, the, on the funding chain, it's still made by the public government mostly because there sits the most money which is fostering certain cultural developments, and, uh, but uh, a lot of times it's dominated by the, by the past, by the history. For example, in Thuringia, um, cultural policy is mainly until what say two or three years ago was mainly about preserving cultural heritage. So that was, that was the dominating uh, cultural policy concept in Thuringia until they came up with a modern cultural concept and now they try to change 
this, this, you know, this, this long tradition of only preserving cultural heritage. Now it's about equity and arts education, cultural tourism. So, but it's only a couple of years old. So, a lot of times, what you can see in rural areas is that um, the, the primarily as, uh, aspects of cultural policy are formulated on the on the state level. But it was made, as far as I understood, also about participatory involvement, bringing in not just the, prof the professional politicians, but instead of that also young people uh, immediately uh, uh, yes. uh, related yeah. to this. Yeah, but that's a problem uh, that uh, Patrick described, because we need professionals to make participation with young people, with other people. You always need one person who are in charge for these kind of processes. And we don't have these persons anymore on local district uh, in many rural areas. And that's why lots of cultural policy is made for rural area, not in rural areas. And uh, in one of my research work, I talked to lots of um, funding, foundations, private foundations, uh, making cultural policy in rural areas. And what they did is bringing art to the poor people and not talking to the poor people what kind of cultural policy they want or they need. One second. Just to answer a question even a bit more, there are two developments we can see right now which are going into the direction of your question. What we can see right now is that there are more and more, let's say, new kind of boards. People are coming together from the private sector, from the public sector, even maybe young boys, undereducated young boys, which are participate in certain boards which are, for example, working together with the public authorities and discussing uh, cultural development. So that's a huge trend right now, I would say, not only in Germany, also in other European co countries, that we, have we need new arenas where we are very discussing cultural policy. And this is one thing which is happening in a lot of regions but right now. So this is one very important thing. Thank you. I have two hands, but maybe I, I ask you, Mish Mishka, uh, 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 when there was the idea of it needs a professional um, to uh, uh, start participatory uh, processes, what was the role of Parliament in your game? Or would you have gone in a similar direction within him as a professional leading this process? Uh, do you have any ideas uh, about that? So you mean by, uh, by not having a, uh, a professional leader or yes. by having another professional leader? Was it important to have uh, Balint with you and in which way? I think it was important, uh, mainly in a way that, uh, that he guided us in, in a sense that we would have gone in, in the same direction but not as fast without him so uh, so he he uh, encouraged us to to uh, do research and to to um, to to speak uh, speak our minds so that uh, so that it's it leads uh, further our our work so I think it was uh, it was good that he was there but uh, but we could have do it without him but less uh, with less efficiency uh, I just uh, have one comment uh, and, and a question. It's, it's, I think we all agree that Europe, or maybe other parts of the world, are, we, we are um, changing in a very dramatic, uh, drastic way demographically because of the large influx of uh, um, uh, refugees and, and immigrants. So we have a new, maybe a new rural, rural uh, uh, problem here of adaptation and so on. And we have, uh, 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 of course, a rural urban problem. In my country, Norway, for example, we have lots of immigrants from small villages in Pakistan who never never saw any city in their life before coming to us and think that Karachi is a city of sin. And then you can imagine seeing our, uh, our way of life. So we have large, large tasks to, before, before us. Um, and uh, in, in Asia, where I uh, live half of the time, we have China now has a, a large uh, uh, project of forced 
uh, forced urbanization. Before they had, during the Cultural Revolution, they had the forced, the forced ruralization. Now they have big numbers coming into the, in, into the city. And, but of course, we here in Europe, uh, uh, we are facing big changes. Do you have any, uh, any ideas of, for example, what is being done in, in Austria and, and Germany to uh, um, what regards cultural policy? So that means uh, that city aspects don't come just to rural areas, but also the other way uh, around, that villages or experiences about villages become part of uh, a city awareness and a city consciousness. Yes. Would you take, uh, find an argument with it? I drink, <laughs> well, um, I mean, I already pointed out the topic of refugees in my, in my, my talk. I think um, you really made a clear point. That's a really big topic. And I would say cultural policy up to now is pretty unprepared to cope with these uh, changes. And uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't have to go to, to, to refugee topic. We can go to demographic change. Uh, in Thuringia, everybody knows that, 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 that it's going to be happen, and everybody knows it since a long time. But everybody says, you cannot see it until, until now. So nobody really reacts on it because it's not so visible. And people just don't tend to be strategic in terms of 10, 15, 20 years, because we have politicians and they get elected for four to five years and they want to get re-elected. So the really tough things we have to do are not done because of our political system. So everybody knows about the problematic, but who makes, who, who throws the first stone in a new direction, for example? That's really complicated. So what I think is what we need more and more is to actually more participatory processes, meet more talking with each other about these things and integrating the people, because most participatory processes up to now are not really participatory. They just include certain groups of the society, but not everybody. So therefore, I pointed out that the topic of equity. If we really take it seriously, we have to put a lot of effort in bringing all the people in the right places to talk about certain developments. That means also refugees, for example. We didn't have any refugees in Thuringia in our processes. That's also a problem, I would say. But it's really complicated. But then you have to invest into participatory process. And then one, one more thing. What we need more is uh, a colleague of mine, we made up a new word. It's called Master of Interspaces. We need more and more people. And it's a big, big, huge field for cultural managers who are able to connect the different people in the community, but also the different political sectors. So uh, I would say this is a, a very important role. We can see also right now, but I think that becomes a more important role. So uh, when we talk about very precise measurements, I would say all the cultural management uh, uh, institutions and universities, they have to really change concerning their educational programs to make people more um, able to really cope with these developments, because I think we're not really ready for it right now. We have a politician uh, among uh, uh, us, short term, long term, we'll see. <laughs> Pete, please. Hi, thanks. Uh, I have a question about on which level the cultural policy about urban areas takes place. I think Thuringia is a, is a lender, one of the lenders. Then you have some communities. Um, in a former job, I was coordinating a network of 50 cultural centers in the a province of Flemish Brabant, which is a region of one million people. And after a couple of years, we divided the region or the province in four regions of each 250,000 people approximately because we found out that the, the communities themselves were too small to really have a, a really rich cultural policy or really uh, developed cultural policy. That's one thing. And second, there was research done that said that um, people uh, want to that 80% of the people of citizens want to uh, have a mobility of 30 kilometers maximum to take part in culture. So the region in which one is um, taking part in culture is like 30 kilometers maximum away, which is also means this kind of size of, in our case. 12 or 13 or 15 communities or 250,000 people together. And there is a need in Belgium, there became a need of a new level of um, working together between communities to have this kind of cultural policy on an extra level. And I was wondering if there is a need also in this way in Thuringia or not. 
Yeah, yeah, sure. that, 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 that was one of the, um, I would say, one of the big questions of the project. Is there a need and are there possibilities to form new kind of regions? Uh, because there has to be more inter-exchange inter and uh, it's also very, very important. You don't need a big theater in every county, in a big museum. You can really uh, think about rearranging it and talking about who does what best, because the problem is right now we have so much institutions and they are sort of underfunded, so we are really losing quality in the meantime. So now the question is who makes the best theater or make the interesting museum, for example. So this is a really a, a, a big question, but the problem is building regions is what is your orientation? Is it a cultural orientation? Is it a geographical orientation, building regions? So that's one of the biggest questions in Thuringia right now, because it's very, very small pieces. 23 different puzzles. Another question is, how can we bring them together? Under, under what measurements? That was one of the biggest questions. But talking about regions, it's a big topic in all, I would say, in all states in Germany, but it's also a big topic in, 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 in the United States, for example, right now, I would say, um, and, and also in other countries I experienced in the last years. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Well, I don't know if the, this is the case in other Europe, European countries, but in Greece, due to the, to the economic crisis as well, but not only because of that, the well-educated people from uh, the cities going to rural, rural, rural areas to work uh, as farmers or try to find something else to do, because there are no jobs in Athens anymore. So these people are making communities, artistic communities, or they're bringing uh, uh, a different way of living in these rural, rural areas. I don't know if this is the case in Germany or other European countries. Uh, it depends on the region. We have region in Eastern Germany, they are getty, getting empty and empty and more empty. Just a few uh, artists are going <laughs> into these areas now. That's quite interesting because that uh, they, they become areas of, um, yeah, how do we say, of, of experiments. That's quite interesting on the uh, one side. On the other side, we have rural areas that they are very popular. In the Speckgürtel, uh, in the, <laughs> the suburbs of cities, um, you have the city nearby, you can uh, have the culture, the uh, shopping malls and everything of the cities, but you have the nature. And in these suburbs, it's cheaper, right? And in these suburbs, uh, lots of... Um, Older people, but health, right now healthy people and rich people are going in these regions and they want and they are very strong uh, in cultural policy because they say, oh, I'm living here now and I'm used to go, or I was used to go to the theater. So we don't need a new theater, but we need a theater groups here. So they are very important for this kind of um, export urban culture into rural regions that are the target groups for these kind of culture, for all the festivals uh, of classical music uh, in Germany. Um, they are uh, funded and uh, run, is running by these kind of people. They uh, have they are the civil society there. Because in lots of, and that's, I think it's a real a huge problem um, in lots of rural areas in eastern Germany, we have no civil society anymore. We can't... They live people, but they, they don't uh, feel as citizens. And that's a real problem. I would come uh, to an end of this uh, uh, panel. Uh, Doreen, you uh, raised the uh, dangerous question of quality, uh, uh, reflecting on what does that mean uh, in terms of arts production and made the difference between culture and, uh, uh, and the uh, arts. Um, Katrin, what would you say is the particular quality uh, of the project uh, uh, No Education? Well, for me, the quality is that it's, you know, it's, it's really not about the kids. It's not about their making them brighter or making them our future um, spectators, but it's a project for the adults, for the 
for the for the for the normal people going there because they learn a lot about them. It's um, that for me is the the quality about it that it, here it really happens that um, the two um, um, not classes well the two they come together and. Uh, Usually you can decide if you, you know, do you want to go to a cultural education project? Do you want to see kids perform? Do you want, you know, and usually you don't want, you go to high quality art. And in this case, they were suddenly there and it, and it mixed and it made, um, it, it, something happened to everyone, to everyone, to, to the artists, to the, to the festival teams. And the quality is, I know that for myself, the quality is, for the first time I had a project, I never talked so much with everyone. I never had an artistic director giving me calls so many times because artists were freaking out because of the kids. I never, I, I talked a lot to the politicians in the area who liked the project, um, who like, because suddenly um, the periphery w was visible and it, it's really about communication. It's a communication project and that's the quality. It's again Mark disturbing. <laughs> now there's just one, one thing I'd like to add because I was happy enough to join also in the Turing Up project. So my impression is that uh, at least in Germany um, the culture policy and things are very much um, characterized by hierarchy and by, by the tendency of keeping things alive the way they are. So. Um, if there is any kind of, of a context change that could lead to a, to a, to a, to a change of things, so uh, lots of effort is invested to um, to try to avoid these kind of changes. The difference in Turing was that um, the demographic situation of the country is so worse, or at least so serious, that um, there is no way of escaping any form of change. But perhaps our way of um, associating this with a negative effect is, is, is wrong. It can be seen also the other way around. So it can be something very positive. So for the first time, we have a, we have a context and a frame which really could lead to a serious change in cultural policy and which can free um, institutions, actors, road system from what has been played a role in the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years. So I think that these kind of changes are, um, um, are resulting in a way of, of free spaces, free rooms, which have to be filled with new efforts, new systems, new plans, new programs. And at least Germany is a country which um, reacts to this kind of uncertainty, all not, not, not always very positive. So what we have to learn is how to cope with these things in a very positive way. And um, making up our mind to, to see that as a real chance, not as a threat. So also the situation with the refugees, the, the, the changes in society, and giving up the idea of this one-dimensional hierarchical thinking. So cities are not better, better than the rural parts. Uh, theater in the city is not better than uh, actual playing in rural situations. So there is a way of there's not one world, there's different kinds of words, and this is a plural way of organizing a society, and these things can fit together and, and well, shape the reality every day a bit new. So it can be something very, very positive. I was just going to try and understand when you're talking about rural and oral, um, urban, what you really mean, um, where I come from, a rural village. Is a, it's usually very, very backward. Um, so given that we don't have a unified central cultural policy or cultural body that we can kind of look up to, um, those that kind of guide cultural activities within those areas are the local chiefs, the traditional rulers who are very removed from what is going on at the central level, which is the government level. So um, we're not, so I guess my, my question is, uh, how do you talk about something that is guiding cultural activities in this context where there is no, it's almost um, paternal in its nature because there is no central body that is saying 
we need to develop theaters here or music here or whatever here. Most of those things are organically done because it's a part of our culture, um, which is very much contained within those clusters of peripheries versus cities. And the cities are more exposed, but those in the rural are quite content with what's going on there. Um, and then you find that those from the um, urban are trying to go to the rural and actually collect what's going on there and bring it to the center because they're losing the richness of our, of our culture. And in the cities, it's been diluted. So they're trying to go and kind of capture the elements of um, what's going on in the rural. I don't know if I'm being very clear. But I guess my question is, the rural is quite almost um, removed. But if there were to be a central cultural policy, they have to take into consideration what's going on in the rural because it's still what is the most authentic about our heritage. Um, so um, how do you then create um, in this context, and I'm, I guess I'm trying to just feed from um, all of you who have kind of seen how policies have guided the way people are thinking about um, theater, or thinking about dance, or thinking about music in what you call the rural versus the urban. So my question would be, how do you take from these um, very isolated um, activities and then bring them to form one kind of institution that is um, helping the development of communities as well as people. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, I guess that's my question. So it's really about what do you think would be a good way to go about something like that, where it's quite different from what you're used to in, in that regard. I find it fascinating the, the term authenticity we haven't heard uh, up to uh, now. Uh, you now brought it in. Have you any reflections on that? Um, you raised a lot of different questions, but I would say most important right now is to build up knowledge about the things who are going on and then try to, to uh, as Mark said, to uh, rearrange the, the existing instruments and approaches. For example, in Thuringia, we, there's one action we, we, uh, we focus on is the, the, the rural areas, they need more independent funds, regional funds, which are maybe, for example, are also you know, funded by private companies, but they need more flexible funds so they can react on certain developments in the rural areas. So for example, if I, if I find a new artist, an interesting artist, I have the possibility to fund, for example, a little event with this artist. Because now we have funding system which is really, really uh, tough structured and it's not flexible. So very important is to build up knowledge and that really not, uh, counts not only for Germany, it also counts for, for example, I've worked a lot of times in, in Egypt, for example, or even in Pakistan. It's really important to build up knowledge and to really get to know what's going on because that's one of the most, uh, well, the biggest problems. A lot of times we have systems and structures which are not really um, up to date anymore. So uh, we have funding systems or political structures and they're too far away from the things which are really happening. So first of all, I think it's very important to have some sort of uh, uh, cultural concept development process. It doesn't have to be a big paper all the time, but it's really important to build up knowledge. And so you can adjust or even create or recreate um, um, certain instruments. So when you say knowledge, knowledge about what? Knowledge about the things which are going on in okay. the rural areas. So who is, who is making, doing art? A mm -hmm. uh, lot of times there are people who are not visible, who have maybe the most, the biggest impact on cultural development, but they're just not seen by, by the people who are responsible, for example. So one of the most important things is to make them visible, to give them a voice. So now I can, I can see them and I can try to help them, for example, to foster something. So it's about knowledge from my point of view. For example, in Egypt, there's a big project right now funded by the European Union, making a cultural map so everybody can understand who is doing what right now in Egypt, in the public sector, private sector, and also in the voluntary sector. So the cultural policy in Egypt, but also the people who are funding certain developments can better understand where they should invest communication, money, coordination, for example. So knowledge is really important in understanding right now. Thank you very much. Uh, in your conversation uh, now, uh, I 
come back and I get a kind of confirmation uh, of my, uh, my thinking in the morning uh, that it's highly dependent who is speaking. Uh, and obviously we have different interpretation what is rural area and what is the background. Uh, and, uh, and we have to take into account that there is a different meaning of rural village uh, in Nigeria, for example, than in Thuringia. Uh, so it's again about uh, yeah, not too early to generalize, uh, but to look concretely um, at the issues that are on the table. Uh, saying this, I would like to say thank you uh, to you uh, for your uh, contributions, uh, having another look uh, on our uh, issue. Uh, I. Uh, would like uh, to propose a sh very short break now. Uh, just get out, come in again uh, with or without uh, uh, coffee. You will be then lucky uh, because um, Anke Schad will take over the uh, moderation uh, and uh, uh, organizing uh, the conversation of the third uh, panel. Thank you very much again.